Let us take a few minutes and talk to our God this morning. Would you all pray with me, please? Most gracious and awesome God, who melted away the snow and allowed us to come this morning free and clear of incident, who stops and makes us be in awe and wonder of the beauty and complexity of your creation as it reflects the beauty and complexity of your love. There are times it is so simple we cannot yet, we cannot help but understand and comprehend your presence, your beauty, your love, your power. But there are other times, O God, when you are presenting your love to us and we just don't get it. We don't understand. We don't comprehend. We have a resistance to see your truth. We'd rather see it our way. Forgive us when we be like Adam and Eve and put our will, our desires in front of your truth, the purity of the wisdom and the steadfastness of your love. Because it is your love that not merely embraces us, but makes us whole taking our brokenness and our insecurities and the things that we are unsure of and giving us the ability to go through. It's not a skill that we've learned. It's not something that happened just by coincidence. But it was your divine intervention that carried us through those moments when we were uncertain of the outcome. Thank you for being a God who is so devoted, so connected, so wanting to break through all the barriers that we put before you and ourselves and be part of our lives. Remember, O oh God, Lynn Caldrone this morning who was not feeling well. Be with her and her family as they care for her at this time and may healing come fast. May her not feeling well be replaced with feelings of health and goodness. And we give thanks for the way that you are with little McKenna Thatcher as she's recovering from the heart catheterization that she had this past week. It was to improve the blood flow and the oxygenation of her blood so she has more energy. And we give thanks and celebrate, O oh God, that you carried her through, that You've allowed through technology of medicine for her body to be just a little stronger than it was before. We also give you thanks in the way of God that you are embracing and walking with Joanne Schulte as she continues to recover from her hip surgery. The way that this body has surrounded and embraced her, caring for her and Al at this time, loving God, that is not something that we just say, oh, that's just who we are but that's our responding to your call to care for each other. I also in remember and uplift you, O oh God, my wife, as she continues to struggle with the muscle cramps that are in her low back emanating down her left leg. Yes, there is some small improvement through the intervention of medication, but loving God, there are times that just weighs so heavy on her on our son, on myself. But in the way that you delivered all of our hero friends that we have in the scriptures through times of stress and difficulty, I know, O oh God, that you are embracing her. In the same way that you embraced Joanne, in the same way that you embraced McKenna, in the same way that you are embracing Lynn. And you will carry her through. Continue to pour your spirit of goodness out upon all these people so that your will can come to pass. For loving God, it is your will that we seek to grow in and fulfill. It is a calling, a calling that asks us to step out of what we know of who and where we are and venture into a journey of trust, a trusting of you, to take us into unknown places 
The explorers of past who came to this continent did that. History records that they did it to escape persecution, but they also had a spirit of adventure, understanding that you, O oh God, had another plan for them, another path for them, and they answered it. Help us to do the same when you put the same calling before us. Whether it be through worship, through study of your scriptures, through our time of prayer, our gathering, our service, loving God, be consistently there calling us guiding us, loving us. Because your essence is first and foremost one of compassionate love. Which is why you bless us and we return those blessings in our offerings. Which is why we stop and do things in the name of your Son for you sent him into this world to save us. To break through and overcome the barriers and allow us and you to be one. You want to be one in a relationship with us. Help us to do our part. Oh, beautiful giving. Oh, beautiful loving. Oh, beautiful and awesome God. We ask this all in your son's precious and most holy name. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning is found in the prophecies of Amos, chapter 5, verses 18 to 24. I got a question. When was the last time you all heard a sermon out of Amos? Raise your hands. Not a very popular book to preach out of. Amos chapter 5, beginning at verse 18. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light. As if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear, or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like ever-flowing streams. May God add a blessing on the reading of his word today. So do you see why Amos isn't too popular in sermons? But there's a reason for his message. The book of Amos is not one of the more popular books in the Bible for Bible studies and sermons. His tone is pointed, his words are direct, and when confronted about his calling of being a prophet of God, he responds on saying, nope, I am a shepherd of sheep and a tender of sycamore trees, but... God called me away from those things to deliver his message to his children. You see, in the time of Amos, the position of prophet had been recognized as a special calling. And there had been like this, almost like a trinity on earth created. You had the priests who were upholding the law, you had the king who was anointed by God, and then you had the prophets who kind of came and kept everyone in check. When Amos was asked, are you a prophet, he said no. Because the people would hear the prophets, but not do anything about it. He merely was a messenger, in his opinion. The term children of God that he uses is a reminder and a reflection of the covenants God made with the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It brings to mind their deliverance from their bondage of Egypt and the gift of the promised land we know today as Israel. From their bondage of Egypt, oh, I already read that. But in living in a postmodern America today, where the generation of loyalty to something is being called to heaven, and the me-first generation means is taking control of everything else, I think as a culture we have a genuine difficulty understanding and valuing what it means to be children of God. It's more than people who just come to church and claim to be Christians. 
Amos, the shepherd of the sheep and tender of the sycamore trees, truly understood this term. And while his book is small, he is considered one of the four dominant figures of what is known as as Hebrew prophecy. The other three dominant figures were Hosea, Micah, and Isaiah. These four prophets deliver their message through the king time of King Jeroboam II. It was a period of prosperity for Israel, economic expansion, national confidence, and a widespread religious enthusiasm. But religious enthusiasm does not mean a people's focused on faith. Religious enthusiasm in these terms means a people who pour their assets into the church so the church can be decadent in its portrayal of worship, but never take any of it to heart. If we were put it into modern terms, they're all about the show, but nothing about the conviction. It was during this time period when many festivals were generated. Grand expositions of opulence, like a Las Vegas show, where worship and spiritual growth were implied but never focused on or expected. The strongest donors were the sponsors and could not wait for the worship elements of the festivals to be over so they could go back to making their money like the money lenders Jesus drove out of the temple. They lived each day, living each day as a worship to God with study and repentance is what is expected and prayer. They were no longer the focus of Israel life. Instead, they became ways of lining the pockets of merchants with copper, silver, and gold. Being the children of God no longer meant a life of daily worship and thanksgiving. Instead, the words were used on special occasions like festivals, or as we would call them, holidays today. Anybody else besides me thankful that there are some stores that are going to be closed on Black Friday? Yay. To display such a behavior during the reign of Jeroboam II would have been considered reckless and financial suicide. Not to mention really, really, really dumb. They had forgotten that all festivals and holidays are a time to stop and remember God's covenant with them and give thanks. Having spent years tending sheep and trees that did not belong to him, Amos has been in a place of preparation for the ministry he has now been called to. God often prepares prophets like this. Think of John the Baptist in the same wilderness and Paul in the desert of Arabia. Many of Amos's sermons are laced with figures of speech that are, peculiar to, that are particular to the desert. He was not a polished scholar like Isaiah, and he was, and he was lacking in cultural refinements of the time. Amos' message, his message and his delivery was usually considered offensive to the court in, of Bethel and the people who were economically profiting from it. In other words, he didn't fit the image they thought that a prophet should have. But Amos' messages did stir the people. It's not easy to find one brief passage in his book to summarize all of Amos' message throughout his book, but the verses of our text today come as close as any. The lesson is simple and pointed. Religious practices, worship, study, prayer, service, giving, not taken to heart by the person who says they believe and uphold them, and implemented into our daily lifestyles, is devoid of righteous living. If you don't do these things, according to Amos, your walk of faith is an abomination to God. And we wonder why Amos isn't very popular. He doesn't mess around. He cuts right to the heart of the problem, the movement and the growth of the church that was being faced in ancient times as well as present time. It is a profession of faith that is devoid of any practice. Like many modern Americans, the people of Israel had misunderstood what God wanted for them. While he showed them with blessing each and every day, and because God was and is the first one who acts on the needs of his children, but they did not get it. Think about it. God always makes 
the first move. He created the heavens and the earth. He created all the elements of nature and the life on the planet that we sit in awe and are still discovering. He created humanity. He sent his prophets when the people went away. He sent a liberator, Moses, to rescue them from Egypt. He sent his son to reconcile the world back to him. Where are we making the first move? It's God. It was through his actions that his son was born, grew into adulthood, assumed the mantle of being the Messiah, died on that cross, and rose again. It was through God's actions that this whole family of God was not only created and rescued throughout history, but God generated a covenant with them to be our God. If we become and remain his children, God is devoted to his children, to his people, Therefore, in the covenant, we need to be devoted back. The Israelites, like many Americans, wrongly understand this to mean that we will be given special blessings or treatment while we're in this world, and our reward is instantly to be with a crown of glory over other nations and to be lifted and ascended into heaven. It's an idea of supremacy being above and better than everybody else. It was reflected in the time of King Jeroboam II in their faith, and it is reflected in the movement of Christianity throughout the world today. Festivals, holidays are created. The one in particular that Amos is talking about is known as the Day of Yahweh, or the Day of the Lord, which was celebrated at the turning of the years, or as we would call it, New Year's Eve to New Year's Day. It was believed that during this celebration, God would finally fulfill the promises of the covenant, and Israel would no longer have to suffer, work hard, and struggle. It was considered to be a day of light, that everything that they had hoped for and wanted and hungered and desired would come to pass because God would put it into place. But they had misinterpreted what that meant. It meant first giving yourself to God and then continuing to give them to him each and every moment of each and every day. The people claimed that they wanted the day of the Lord, referring to the Lord's manifestation of himself and righteousness, would include judgment for evildoers and deliverance of the believers. So anyone that you think is beneath you or aside from you or not doesn't believe like you, God's going to deal with them and you're going to be A-OK. The talk of this event was superficial. And for those who are of nominal faith, whose faith is devoid of righteousness, Amos is saying this day will be anything but a day of light. It will be a day of eternal darkness. He draws on his desert experience here to point out the consequences of people who only see the evil, the problems, and the brokenness of others, but never see it within themselves. They may call on God for deliverance, but fail to realize that their own evil, the places where they do not put God first, but their own will first, is getting in their way of having the faith-filled contentment and connection with God that we hunger and thirst for. It's like someone who runs from a lion only to be, eat, found, be found by a bear and eaten. It's like a person who runs from an attacker into a house only to lean up against the wall and rest and to have a poisonous snake bite, and have a poisonous snake bite them. God wants a faithful people, a faithful church, where worship, study, prayer, and service are vital and relevant, not something that needs to be done because, well, that's what it means to be religious. That's what it means to be a church. That's what it means to be a people of God. 
In Amos' day, the noble idea of sacrificial worship, which reflected the inner attitude and the commitment of one giving the offering, had degenerated into a selfish attempt to manipulate God. Yo, God, do you see that really expensive calf that I had them put on the grill for the sacrifice? I went above and beyond for you, so you're going to do something special for me, right? That was the idea then. There are people that are still operating under that idea today. We cannot manipulate God. We cannot control God, stop God, hide from God, run from God, or believe that God is not there to see, hear, and know the thoughts and feelings we keep in the recesses of our minds and our souls. God knows how genuine we are every time we walk through the door, every time we give of ourselves, every time that we serve. God knows what's going on even if we don't bother to acknowledge it. In verses 21 to 23, these are the essential elements of Israel's worship, as pointed out one by one, festivals, sacrifice, and praise. God is speaking through Amos in unmistakably clear, total reaction to Israel's worship. They had the ritual, they didn't have the conviction. While God wants to delight in the character of his people, and he wants to take comfort in the aroma of the sacrifices and the earnestness of them, but if the heart, souls, and minds are not genuine behind that sacrifice, that service, that worship, God not only rejects the offering, but God will not lend his ears to the praise of the music and the song and the prayers. Why? You ever wonder why? Because Amos is capturing the essence that God has had enough of heartless and meaningless ritual. God wanted to see the basic virtue of a godly life. God wanted justice to be ensured that fair and equal treatment of all people would take place in his name. No private jokes behind a person's back. No gossip. No hidden agendas. God wanted righteousness for both the vertical reaching up to him and the horizontal reaching out to others in genuine, healthy, full relationships. And in order to do that, we have to be right with God in order to reach up and to reach out to those around us. These virtues were to be practiced on a legal basis in the businesses that we conduct, the personal relationships we had. It's a call not only to do away with the ceremony and ritual, but it is a call to focus, be honest, and the worship, the study, the prayer, and the service. Not only to happen once a week when you gather and do the thing, but to do it every day. Where all elements of our life is worship. One of my favorite seminary professors had a saying that they used to say in class, It doesn't matter how high you jump, how loud you sing, how low you bow your head when you pray and worship. It's about how straight you walk when you leave. We only take God's grace. If we only take God's grace and not apply it to our lives and share it with others, we're not walking straight. Instead, we're walking very, very shallow and crooked. When it comes to our relationship with God and with each other, we cannot substitute or manipulate things to be more to our liking. We have to listen to God's words, trust his power and and the grace of his sovereignty, and follow the path that is revealed to us, even if we don't like it or understand it. What God wants from us is a life of authentic an authenticating commitment of justice and right living together. 
The people of Israel convinced themselves that they were just built and sustained for the commitment of the institution known as the temple. Today we would call it the church. With attendance and financial support and a boatload of programs, God would be satisfied. And in doing so, what they did was substitute institutionalism for obedience. Church talk for doing things the way God wants us to. And religious ritual for morality and, and virtue. Walking straight and upright. What Israel basically did was replace their faith, their God-directed faith with a human-made religion. Our prosperous nation with both a church on almost every street corner is very similar to Israel of the 8th century before Jesus was born. Any society that cares more to gain, more for gain than honor, more about their standard of living than God's standard, is sick. In other words, if your goal and your agenda comes before our gods, Amos says, you got a problem. Any church that accepts lavish support as a substitute for righteous behavior ain't right with God. Any church that thinks God will accept and, cor and correct a creed of perennial activity as substitutes for plain obedience ain't right with God. In the eyes of God, there can be no division or dichotomy between our faith and the ethics of our morality. They truly need to be one. If we are not careful, we can also let our worship become superficial and shallow. Emotion and enthusiasm can take the place of righteousness lived out within the community. Ritual, ritual can become a substitute for reality. We might profess loudly what we believe, but unless we practice what we profess, God will not honor it. Just as in the time of Amos, what God really wants still rings true today. What God wants is justice flowing from us. Oceans of it, filled with thoughts and action that reflects God's presence both in our lives and the lives of others. And God wants fairness, rivers of it, flowing with, flowing with upright people going forth to take each day as a day of worship. So Amos is saying, put God first. See the world the way he does. See the need that needs to be addressed. Lean on him for the calling and how it should be addressed. And live it each and every day in our lives. Amos may not be too popular for preaching and studies. But I like how he kicks me straight sometimes. Would you all pray with me, please? Help us, O oh God, to see and follow and understand what you want from us. To turn off the programming of the world that permeates our lives and allow your presence, your wisdom, your power, not merely to guide us, but to shine through us. That's what you offered and exemplified when you sent your son Jesus into the world. He brought justice by treating everyone the same. He didn't, he didn't treat those with more better than those who had less. He treated them all fairly, equally, lovingly. Help us to do the same thing. To not get caught up in the, hey, look at what I've done. But to see the world you, the way you see it. A world where your beauty and your presence is needed is breaking through like a river through a dam. 
Allow us to see it, identify it, and be part of it. For we, O oh God, seek to be on a path of righteousness. Because you sent your Son, we celebrate. Amen. So you know how you get things right? You take the hint from our closing hymn. You let Jesus shine through you. Put me first in everything. If we put God first in everything, living a life of justice, walking on a path of righteousness, happens automatically. Because we are tuning our minds with the mind of our Creator, with the mind of our Savior, with the mind of our Sustainer. When I think about what it means to be children of God, both in the reflection of the prophecies of Amos, the Old Testament, the law, and the message that Jesus spoke today, they're all pointing us the same way. This world is not ours. But we are called and created to be God's children. Let's live that way. So as this council gathers for their quick meeting after the worship, and y'all stick around for the vision team that's happening afterwards, if you're not sticking around for either one of those, as you go from this place, take what you've heard. Think about it. Pray about it. Wrestle with it. And if the Spirit calls you to, apply some of it to your lives. But as you all go, do not be afraid, ashamed, or scared to let the world know that you all are people of God. Go in grace. Be filled with his peace.